This is a fascinating, <clears throat> remarkable story. A seven-year-old boy becomes king of Judah. Can you imagine? Now, that's young. And what's amazing is how Joash, the seven-year-old boy, becomes king. Chapter 23, the previous chapter, tells us the story of his father, Ahaziah, who, and he, he was one of the most wicked kings of, in Judah, in the history of Judah. Not only did he turn away from God, he turned the nation away under the influence of uh, his mother and Joash's grandmother, Athaliah, who was a descendant of King Omri, the daughter of the infamous King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, uh, had influence in this. You can imagine. That's, she, she was certainly a bad influence. Uh, and uh, I said this a few weeks ago, and I just want to repeat it. We talked about sheep rubbing heads, and it does matter who you rub heads with. We are influenced by other people. Whether we want to admit that or not, we are de definitely influenced by other people. And so here we find the influence goes back to King Omri and Queen Jezebel and to this grandmother uh, upon this king. And this king, Ahaziah, dies after reigning just one year. The custom of that day was to choose one of his sons to succeed him. Only before they could do so, Athaliah, Joash's grandmother, remember, who's been influenced by Jezebel, slew all of his brothers so that she could be queen. Slew them all. Can you imagine? The grandmother. But before she could get to Joash, who was only one year old at that time, and the rightful heir to the throne, who was only one at the time, one year old, Joash, and he would have been the rightful heir to the throne. He was rescued and he was hid. He, he would then be raised secretly in the temple precincts by his godly uncle, and, and who was also a priest, Jehoiada. Remember that name, Jehoiada. And his aunt Jehoshabeth, Joash, you could say this of Joash, he was literally a brand uh, plucked from the fire. Now, here's what I want you to think about. And this certainly would apply as we head toward uh, this Christmas season. The lineage of David is almost extinguished here. The prophecy of the coming Messiah, the hope of salvation is hanging by a thread, if this one-year-old boy dies, the promise, the promises of God would then have failed. The Messiah, the Savior, must come through the lineage of David. So here we see this how critical this is. And we know the power behind this, trying to stop the Messiah from coming, Satan himself. So it just adds a little more to this story when you consider what's happening here. When Joash was seven, his godly uncle priest Jehoiada came up with a carefully designed plan to make him king. And when the time was right, he brought him forth, put a crown on his head, and anointed Joash, declaring, God save the king. Well, the queen, Athaliah, this wicked daughter of Jezebel, declares treason. And she's going crazy here, trying to persuade the people, but they are not persuaded. And so they execute her for all of her evil. And seven-year-old Josiah, or Josiah, Joash, becomes king. That's an amazing story, isn't it? It's quite a story. He becomes king because of his uncle, the priest, and his wife who rescued him. Obviously, a child of seven years old 
could not rule a nation, so Jehoiada was his tutor and his mentor. He, along with his wife, raised him, nurtured him, taught him, prayed over him. They realized his importance because he's the last in the lineage of King David. So he will grow from a child into a man. Yet always near him is this priest and his wife helping him, guiding him, teaching him the ways of God. Throughout his life, King Joash had a wonderful privilege. He had the direct influence of his godly spiritual mentor. And just to show you how uh, wonderful that influence had to have been, how respected this priest Jehoiada was in the nation. I want you to look at verses 15 and 16. It says, But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. 130 years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. So this old priest lived for 130 years. And now after this long life of godly devotion, he dies. And when he dies, the people of Judah... They honor him. He is so respected. They, they honored him amongst uh, uh, burying him in the city of David among all the other kings of Judah. And he's not a king because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. He, this was a respected, influential man, greatly so. Uh, Charles Spurgeon writes, see the influence of one man. One man can sway a state. One man can check sin. One man can be the head of a host who shall serve God and honor his name. And, and just think of the ways that the Bible tells us that this priest, Jehoiada, brought godly influence into the life of King Joash. When, 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 the, when the boy was crowned at seven years of age, one of the first official acts was that the, the, the priest Jehoiada performed was that, that they set into the hands of the young man, a written copy of the law of God. It says in verse 11 of chapter 23, Then they brought out the king's son and put upon him a cr the crown and gave him the testimony and made him king. And you can be sure that the old priest taught him daily and read the Bible to him before he could even read. Re taught him to reverence it and to obey it. Verse 3 says this about Jehoiada. It says, And Jehoiada took for him two wives, and he begat sons and daughters. So as he continues to grow, Jehoiada, this great godly influence, is looking out for this young man. And, and, and in those days, this would have been common amongst kings. And uh, so Jehoiada, this godly priest, wants to make sure that Joash doesn't fall by the way of other kings of Israel marrying pagan wives and hence being influenced and, and, and causing uh, uh, the nation to fall at, away from God. So he picks out these uh, wives for Joash in order that they would be a good influence, support him, be devoted to God's call on his life and as well the lineage of the Ma Messiah must continue, so, Je so Jehoiada is making sure <laughs> that this godly line continues. It's a remarkable influence. It really is. A godly man, this priest named Jehoiada, verse 2 says, and this is, a, this is interesting, it says, and Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And I want you to notice it says, All the days of Jehoiada the priest. He was a good boy. He was godly. Chapter, chapter 24 tells us that he restored the temple where it had been desecrated and fallen into ruin under uh, Athaliah. And, and he reproved the priests because they weren't getting the job done in a, in a timely manner. And, and uh, Joash secured the funds and till it was all completed. And then notice what it says in verse 14. It says, And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. So this good boy, now good king, repairs the temple 
and proper worship is restored. I mean, this is great. The godly people in Judah must have been rejoicing that now on the throne, after having wicked kings, is this obedient descendant of David. It, 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 was, it was a great time. But what they did not know about this young king was that he had a very shallow faith. Very shallow faith. We're going to get to that in a minute. They didn't know that. I want you to notice the ominous tone of verses 2 and verses in verse 14. Let me read them again to you. In case you didn't catch it, in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 2, it says, And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And notice this. How long was that? All the days of Jehoiada the priest. And then in verse 14, And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually. They had godly worship, restored worship. How long? All the days of Jehoiada. Joash did that was right, that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did good, but he did not do good all the days of his life. He did good all the days of Jehoiada, the priest's life. As long as Jehoiada was alive to bring up, up, up upon him his personal influence, well, Joash was true and faithful to God as long as Jehoiada was living. You got that? But then Jehoiada dies. And I want you to notice what happens in verse 17 after Jehoiada dies. This is quite interesting. It shows us how the enemy of our soul works. It says, now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king then the king hearkened unto them so after Jehoiada is dead some of Joash's peers come to see him now let me let me let me just tell you something about our enemy the devil he is not stupid nor is he impulsive like we tend to be he is waiting in the wings biding his time for the exact right moment to attack Joash and I can say this he's doing the same thing waiting in the wings at the right time to attack you and me at the right time without the influence of his godly uncle this this good king is about to be tested and the shallowness of his faith is about to be revealed. The officials of Judah did not approach Joash while Jehoiada was alive. This godly man, no, no, no. The time was not right when Jehoiada was alive, but as soon as he's dead and Joash is vulnerable, they come and he falls under the influence of these princes, these peers, a good king is about to go bad. Are you with me? It's an interesting story, isn't it? Some great spiritual principles here for us. I want you to notice the way of the tempter. The princes bow before Joash, fawning over him, flattering him, you know. And I just want to say this. It's not likely that the godly Jehoiada uh, was doing any bootlicking. No. Now, don't uh, misunderstand. He would have honored that office. He would have great respect for it. But he would have spoken the truth faithfully to the king, putting God above everything else. So these, these fawning princes, they gain influence uh, with the king. I don't know what they said. I can only imagine what they might have said. I would have liked to have been there to heard what they were saying. But can I just, if you will allow me this morning, can I just uh, 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 say some things how it might have gone down? You know, I, I can almost imagine them saying, hey, Joash, 
Why are you still doing the things uh, uh, like that old priest wants you to do? Don't you know that's old school, man? The dude was 130 when he croaked. Come on, Joe Ash, this is a new day. Quit being an old fuddy-duddy. God loves us just like we are. He doesn't care if we have a little bit of fun. Come on. No other nation does this kind of stuff. They worship, and they have a good time doing it. And you really think God's intimidated by a few little idols here and there? Come on. You need to get with the times, Joash. God's doing a new thing. Woo. I mean, I could camp out there and preach for a while. Oh, don't let me get on my soapbox, because I want to. But I'll leave it. You understand. So they butter him up. They bow before him. They compliment him. They pull him in. This is how the enemy does it, folks. He then, without that godly influence of his uncle and, and, and priest, he, and then with the ungodly influence of his peers, he turns his back on God. And not only does he turn his back on God, as leaders would do, he brought Jerusalem down with him. And verse 18 says, listen to this, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this uh, for this, their trespass. So all the idols and, uh, that have been pulled down is set back up again, including in the temple. He, he did away with the sacrifices, folks. Listen to this. This is, this is the work of the enemy. You see it in these Old Testament examples. He, he does away with the sacrifice, which typifies what? It typifies Christ, the coming Redeemer. So what it, and it's this remedy of, for sin. It was in the, it is now, and it was in the Old Testament as they look forward to the coming Redeemer. We look back at what he did. You know, it, 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 you know so, so, so here they, their, their thought is, right, it's a new day. There's no need to preach Christ and him crucified. And you know, the, this is what's happening today. You go to so many places. It's about everything but Jesus and him crucified. And let me just, uh, just let me admonish you for a moment because I am your pastor and I want you to understand and know the difference between what is right and what is evil. And, and let me just tell you this. I don't care what the church is like, how many people attend, how great their music is, how, how dynamic the preacher is. I, I want to just say this. Be very wary of any ministry that does not have as its central message Jesus Christ and him crucified. Be wary. He is. Jesus is the only redeemer. Only remedy for the sin cursed soul, and he must be the center of all that we do. And if he's not, folks, you need to run. Run as fast as you can run. Notice it says, this is another important spiritual principle here. Notice that it says, they left the house of the Lord their, uh, of their fathers, meaning that they forsook God. His house, they forsook his house, which always, always goes hand in hand. Listen, you forsake God's house, the result, you end up in sin, you end up serving idols. You can argue with me all you want to, I don't need church, I don't need that, I, 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 you abandon God's ordained means for your growth, your encouragement, His way of strengthening you, your life, you'll end up forsaking God's truth. It's a principle and it's a right one that we need to take heed to. So Joash is weak. He's not strong enough to stand on his own two feet without Jehoiada in his life. That godly influence, he is now influenced for evil. He has gone from a good king to a bad king, from a good boy to a bad boy. 
Hmm? And what was the result of his going bad? Of forsaking God or forsaking his house? God sent his wrath. I can assure you what was true of Joash is true of us all. Yet, I want you to see something here. Before God pours out his wrath, he is a merciful God, and he extends his hands of mercy always. Verse 19 says this, Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not. Listen to this. Here, here we go again. This is so full of lessons they would not give ear joash and the princes resisted the prophets and their attempts to call them back to the lord they would not give ear this is this hebrew word for give ear is sometimes used in reference of a dog and uh, a, 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 of a dog's ear i should say you, you've probably, I mean, you've had to see this. It's, it's, it's almost comical sometimes when the dog hears something, their ears raise up, right? You ought to see our little Yorkie. Big ears. And, and, and it's, it's kind of comical, but it's the idea is that. This is the idea here. They, when you would not give ears, it's like ignoring it. Ears down, right? Droopy ears. It's the opposite. So what's this mean? It means they ignored the warning. They didn't listen. How often this is the case. The prophet speaks, but he's ignored. The word of God is preached, but ears are not lifted. Ears are not lifted up. I just want to say this. God help us to always have perked up ears. Hear me now. I mean, if I could pray a prayer today for all of us, I would pray, God, help us to always have perked up ears, ears to hear what you are saying. Uh, I, I, I want you to know this. I don't always measure up, and I may not be measuring up, but I want to have my ears lifted up. I may, have to, I may have, when I hear what I hear, I may have to fall on my knees and ask God to help me in my weakness, but let me have ears ready to hear God's Word because we get in trouble when we won't lift up our ears. That's when we're in trouble. I'm not listening anymore. I don't want to hear it. Now we got trouble. We don't want to hear it because it's exposing our sin. We don't want to hear that, do we? Who wants to hear that? I don't want to hear that, yet I do want to hear that. I want to know. I want my ears perked up because I might have to fall on my face before God, but let me fall on my face. Let me hear. Let my ears be raised. Come on now. Let's read on. It says in verse 20, And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. Now listen, this, a, this is a, another twist in this story. This is, this is something here. The son of the priest, that godly priest, Jehoiada, the one who had raised Joash, the one who rescued him, has a son who is now a prophet. He's influenced by his daddy too. This is Joash's cousin. It says, Which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith, the, saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? He's saying, Don't listen to these princes who, who cause you to transgress uh, uh, jo uh, Joash. They're saying, telling you it's a new day. There's no new days. There's only one kind of Christianity. It never changes. The message never changes. There's no new one. There's no new message. He says, he goes on to say that you cannot prosper because you have forsaken the Lord. He hath also forsaken you. So we he, see another principle here. The, the Hebrew word for forsake is the same word used in verse 13, translated left. You forsake him. He will forsake you. You leave him, and the consequences is he leaves you. Some of the saddest words in the Bible are found in Matthew 23, just prior to the Lord's crucifixion, when it says, Jesus says this. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are, uh, which are sin unto thee. Listen to this. How oft would I have gathered 
thy children together, even as a hen, her chickens under his wings, and you would not. I wanted to do it. I tried to do that. I met, I've offered it. I've come to you. I, here I am. But it says this, they would not. And verse 38 says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. This is a principle. You leave him, the result is you're left desolate. Now, he doesn't want that. He wants you to come. But if you will not, desolation. So, with no more godly influence from his uncle, or even God himself now, because God's now left. Joash, the king, he murders the son of his uncle, Jehoiada, his own cousin who confronted him with God's word. The deed is done right in the temple precincts. Think of that. He says in verse 21, 22, and it says, And they conspired against him and stoned him with the stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. Now think about that. Joash kills the son of the man who saved his life and put him on the throne. King Joash and his cousin were raised in the same household. They are cousins, for heaven's sake, they're cousins. Let me tell you something. When there is no godly influence, there is no bounds to what evil we might do. Yes, even to our own families. To our own families. And when he died, that is Jehoiada's son, he said, the Lord look upon it and required, indeed the Lord did look upon it and required or repaid. And it didn't take long. We're told that the Syrians came with a small company of men, and God used a small contingent to execute judgment in a humiliating fashion upon Joash and that larger Israeli army. They had forsaken God. God has forsaken them. Verse 25 says, And when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, talking about Joash. His own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada, the priest, and slew him on his bed. And he died, and they buried him in the city of David. But they buried him not in the sepulchers of the king. Wow. Joash forsook God. God forsook Joash to an invading army. Joash cast off God's rule. Joash's servants cast off his rule. Joash conspired against Zechariah. Joash's servants conspired against him. Joash murdered a defenseless man. His servants murdered him as he lay sick, wounded is what it means, and defenseless he lay in bed. Joash did not heed the dignity of Zechariah's office as a prophet. They had him stoned. Joash's servants did not heed the, his dignity as a king. They had him buried outside the tombs of the kings. Now remember when Jehoiada died, the old priest who was not a king was buried with the kings. He was so honored. They buried him with kings. But when Joash the king dies, he's buried not with kings. He dies in shame. Hear these words, folks. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. And reap did Joash ever. Oh, he reaped. It's another principle. You can't escape it. So what solemn lessons we learn? A good boy gone bad. Joash was raised with such a spiritual privilege. You, you think about him. He had to think often about how he was spared at the age of one when all of his other brothers were slaughtered. And you, you know he had to be thinking, why me? Why, not, why, why was I spared and not them? Surely... Surely he had to think, God has a great plan for my life. He spared me. Yet he dies in shame, lost without God. What, what a privilege he had to have been raised by a godly uncle and aunt and who had not only 
saved him when he was young and helpless, but cared for him and put him on the throne and taught him the ways of God. Surely you would think that he could recognize the providential hand of God in his life. But I wonder, do we recognize God's providential hand in our life? Can you look back and see him at work? Oh, let us think for a moment this morning. Perhaps he spared your life. Perhaps someone had a spiritual impact on you, much like Jehoiada did in Joash's life. Who, who, who has had such an impact on your life? Uh, the somebody has. That you, listen, you wouldn't be where you are today if it wasn't for that Jehoiada. You might say, well, God did it. And that, that, that's true. But who does God use? He uses people. Who prayed for you? Who cried over you? Who taught you? Who spiritually fed you? Who was your Jehoiada? Was it your grandmother? Maybe a mother, a father, both? Sunday school teacher, perhaps? A pastor, an uncle, an aunt, a friend? Think about it. Somebody has influenced you or several people have influenced you greatly you say you say wow if it wasn't for that teaching if it wasn't for that influence that sermon that man that woman i wouldn't be here i'd be lost i might not even be alive today if it wasn't for my jehoiada i could be dead there are people in our lives that god sends but like jehoiada I think of those people in my life, sacred memories I have. My mother who prayed for me and took me to church made me go. My pastor, when I was a little boy, he took time to pay attention to me. And he invited me to ride. I still remember getting in his car and going to a revival meeting with him. It had such an impact on me as I looked up at him so my, my aunt, who wouldn't quit loving me, invited me to church when I was lost, when I was running away from God. She, 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 she was so influential in getting me to come to church to be saved, to hear the word. And then she taught me how to minister and to love people. She took me where others wouldn't go, forgotten places like nursing homes and hospitals and such. And she taught me how to serve and doing whatever was needed for God's kingdom. I think of those since my salvation who have influenced my life. So many men and women, some of you are here today. Some whom have gone on to heaven. Some of them I have thanked personally. Others, I will think when I, get to, when I get to glory, I'm going to thank them. I have been so privileged, spiritually speaking. I am who I am today because of those Jehoidas that God put in my life. And he's put them in yours. Some of you may be thinking, yes, but I didn't have it like that. Oh, well, Pastor, I grew up in an ungodly environment. My parents divorced. I never felt loved or accepted. I, I never received any spiritual influence or encouragement as a child, and on and on and on and on and on we go. But you are spiritually privileged because, listen to me, folks, you're here today, aren't you? You're hearing God's word right now. You're talking about being spiritually privileged. Somebody or something in your life has influenced you or you would not be here today. And I want to just say this. None of us, none of us have a perfect past. No, don't look at me like you do. And none of us have a perfect family. Joash certainly didn't. His own grandmother killed all of his brothers, and if she could have got his hands on him, she'd have killed him. He was raised without a father, yet we see in his life the providential hand of God. I'm telling you, God providentially has put Jehoiadas in your life, and you're here today because of that Jehoiada. He's been merciful to you. He's given you, as he does all of us, an opportunity to be saved and to live for him. And I want to tell you this. He loves us all the same. He's not a respect of persons. I thank God for all 
the Jehoiadas in my life. And so should you. So should you. Don't take it lightly. They don't live forever. And I now want to be a Jehoiada to somebody. I hope I am. I hope I'm a Jehoiada to, to those people I pastor. We desperately need them in our lives. If not for Jehoiada, Joash does not live. Yet because Joash did not learn to stand on his own two feet, because he didn't have that proper relationship he should have had with the Lord, he didn't love God as he ought. When Jehoiada's influence was replaced with ungodly influence, he didn't make it. He didn't make it. How many times have we seen a kid go off to college, raised in a Christian environment, they don't make it? How many times has a spouse died and the other doesn't make it? Doesn't make it. The king had never taken the truth into his heart. His faith was shallow because it had never taken root. And that's a warning for us all. Truth must take root in our hearts. Paul, Paul tells us our obedience must be with a sincerity of the heart. Let me read what he says in Ephesians 6, verse 6, regarding our obedience. He says, not with eye service, meaning when others are watching. As men, men pleasers, not, not obedience, not just to please men, but as the servants of Christ. Now listen to this. Doing the will of God. From where? From the heart. From the heart. Obedience is a heart issue. If only in the mind, obedience will be shallow and reluctant and we will not stand. That's why legalism doesn't work. A list of do's and don'ts never works because it has to be God's word and his will has to be internalized. Psalms 119 verse 11, the psalmist says, Thy word have I hid where? In mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It's a heart issue. As Warren Wiersbe states, Jehoiada was a, re, was a religious prop on which the king leaned. When the prop was removed, the king fell. Indeed, a good boy, a good king goes bad, and he dies in shame without God. Here's what I want to ask you this morning as they come. Can you stand on your own two feet? Has your faith taken root inside in the heart? Is God's word here in your heart? Do you obey him from the heart? You get that? Not just because you have it up here. Do you obey him? from your heart. Jesus said, if a man loves me, you keep my word. If he loves me, it's a heart obedience. That's what we need. If I may illustrate with this little story of a, of a teenage girl one night a group of teenagers were enjoying a party when someone suggested that they go to a certain establishment for a good time. A young, that young lady named Jan said to her date that night, I'd rather you would take me home and she said, my parents don't approve of that place. And one of the girls said, 
afraid of your father, afraid he'll hurt you? To which Jan replied, no, I'm not afraid my father will hurt me. I'm afraid I'll hurt my father. That's a heart of love. That's obedience from the heart. So why is it you obey God? It'll be the test of whether your faith is shallow or real and genuine. Because it ought to be, oh, I don't want to get caught. It shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be, oh, if I do this and somebody sees it, or if I do this, no. It ought to be, I don't want to break my father's heart. I don't want to sin against my father. Jesus died for me. I, it ought to break your heart. And repentance works the same way. It's not sorry I got caught. It's sorry I broke the heart of God. It has to take root inside. It has to be internalized. So what kind of faith do you have? We thank God for the Jehoiadas. But can you stand without your Jehoiada? I'd like to think I'm a Jehoiada to some of you at least. I would like to think that this church is a Jehoiada to you. But maybe it's your mama, maybe it's your father, maybe it's your grandmother, your grandfather, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's your spouse. Whoever that Jehoiada is or there may be many Jehoiadas. Can you stand when they're gone? Because Jehoiadas don't live forever. Their influence can stay with you, but you've got to learn to stand on your own two feet.